wanted to talk this afternoon about a servant of God, a man that you're familiar with, I think, a man who was called in good times. The old saying is, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. This man didn't believe that. He believed that when the going gets tough, the tough get running. Now, you maybe know who I'm referring to. We're talking about somebody from the early 8th century BC who was a prophet to northern Israel. Very interesting individual whose prophetic ministry started out in a way that perhaps we haven't even focused on before. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 14 to start out. 2 Kings 14. 2 Kings 14. And verses 25 through 28. 2 Kings 14, verses 25 through 28. The prophet Jonah came on the scene in the 8th century BC. And um, this was shortly before the fall of northern Israel. And something rather unusual took place at this phase in the history of the northern uh, nation of Israel with its capital in Samaria. As you probably realize, northern Israel was in rebellion against God essentially from the time after Solomon died. You remember, of course, that the nation split. You have uh, uh, Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south, 10 uh, tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. And if you read the history of the northern kingdom, it says consistently they did evil in the sight of the Lord. There was never a, a rededication or a revival in the northern kingdom. But we get to this period of time in the 8th century BC and something interesting happens here. I don't know that I can fully explain it, but let's read about this anyway. Uh, here in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. He, he is Jeroboam II here, named no doubt after his ancestor. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamat, that's up in, way up in the north, north of Damascus, to the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai the prophet who was from Gat Hefer. So Jonah was on the scene before the events recorded in the book of Jonah. Let's keep on reading. Verse 26. For the Eternal saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter. It's hard times for them, even though there was no revival, no rededication. And whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. There's that word, ezer. No helper for Israel. And the Eternal did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Verse 28, you can read about the rest of it, or at least you could. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did, how his might, how he made war, how he recaptured for Israel from Damascus and Hamat what had belonged to Judah. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Yes, in de indeed they are, but that's not our first and second Chronicles. That's some ancient document that has long since disappeared. Anyway, here we have a fascinating mention here of Jonah on the scene, where you've got this man, Jeroboam II, and he's on the throne of northern Israel. It was a time of sin. It was a time of rebellion against God. Nobody did what was right in God's sight. And yet, paradoxically, it was a time when the territorial extent of northern Israel grew big. It grew actually quite big. Maybe not quite as big as in David's time, but it grew back. And God partially restored that nation of northern Israel. And Jonah was on the scene, and he prophesied about it. And you know, when I read this little section of scripture, I think probably Jonah at that point thought, okay, my life is over. I'm on easy street. I am now a prophet emeritus. I can go home and relax. But as you know, he couldn't. Now, this event, of course, took place prior to the events recorded in the book named after him. His la life then changed. His life changed. And of course, at that point, he's called on to go and prophesy to people he did not like. He probably liked the northern Israelites, but he did not like, I'm sure he didn't, it's pretty clear from the book, he didn't like Ninevites, he didn't like Assyrians. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were very, very cruel, terribly cruel people. Uh, probably many of us have seen the uh, very famous black obelisk of King Shalmaneser, maybe some have seen it in person. If you've ever gone to the British Museum, if you're going to the UK for the feast this year, go and take a look at it. It's really quite famous. It's this fairly large granite obelisk 
with images on it and some writing. And I think the archaeologists took a little while to try to figure out who is this king who's bowing down with his nose to the ground before this nasty Assyrian king. Shalmaneser was one of the great kings of Assyria. It actually turns out to be King Yehu of Israel a little earlier, and he's bowing in homage because you know what? You did not cross the Assyrians. They were bad dudes. They had this uh, habit of skinning alive anyone who opposed them. They were really, really brutal. And they would impale sometimes leaders of little nations who dared stand up to them. So Jonah's life took a turn, I'm sure he saw it, as a turn for the worse. And the events taking place here then in the book of Jonah, and let's turn to the book named after him, are really quite fascinating. I've always been fascinated by this. We're going through the Minor Prophets. Uh, right now, we just began the book of Jonah at Foundation Institute this week. We had one class yesterday. It's an, it's an interesting book. Um, it's much more of a narrative than some of the other prophets. It's a story about a man who was a servant of God. But what do we learn from it? Because he was, it was, in some ways, it was quite, quite, quite different from Abraham. We can learn a lot from Abraham. Abraham did what he was told to do. He was told to go and he went. He was told to sacrifice his son, and he was willing to do it. That's quite a thought. Jonah is a little different here. Let's read Jonah 1, verse 1. The word of the Eternal came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, he's, that Amittai is his father, and he is from Gat Hefer in the area of Zebulun. We associate Zebulun with modern Holland or the Netherlands. And then in verse 2, he's told, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. This would be a little bit like somebody during the Second World War being told to go from Holland to Nazi Germany. Or maybe if we want a closer parallel, somebody from North Texas being told to go to Imperial Japan and to call on them to repent. Nineveh was the capital of the evil empire. It was uh, not top of Jonah's bucket list. It was uh, a, a, a place where he didn't want to go. He'd heard about these people and how nasty and cruel they could be. And this was the last thing in the world he wanted to do. His first act, verse 3, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. His first act he flees. Now, this book is full of ironies, and the title of the sermon is Seven Ironies of the Book of Jonah. I think there's a lot for us to learn as we go through this. Seven ironies. Now, he flees to Tarshish. Tarshish is associated with modern Spain. He was probably headed across the Mediterranean to get as far away from God as he possibly could. Joppa was on the Mediterranean coast. I think we actually went there in 2016. A group of us went to Israel. This was actually the place where Peter encountered, Corn encountered Cornelius in the book of Acts. And uh, Jonah's determined to get out of town as quickly as he can. He doesn't like what God has given him to do. And as in so many cases in the Old Testament, we're not told what he's thinking. He is not happy. He's not a happy camper. He's not willing to do what, he wanted, what God wanted him to do. Verse 4, but the Eternal sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship was about to be broken up. Crashing waves, furious storm. You ever been in a storm on the sea? Or perhaps more likely, some of us from time to time have been in an airplane when the airplane hits turbulence. The real shot in the arm for the prayer life, isn't it, when that kind of thing happens? Actually, modern airplanes are pretty good. At, you know, they're designed to, to survive that kind of thing. This kind of ship, I don't think, was. These giant waves pounding against this uh, sea vessel, and the ship was about to be broken up. It was that serious. It's about to be broken. And we get to the first irony here in verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, they are pagans. We've got God with a small g here and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. Irony number one. The mariners pray. Jonah is taking a little nap down in the belly of the ship. Jonah, the true servant of God, is fast asleep, and the mariners are concerned. 
and they, want, they don't want everybody to die in this horrifying storm. I think it must have been really pretty, pretty serious. Verse 6. So the captain said to him, and he said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call on your God. He doesn't yet know whose God, Jonah's God, is. And the ancient pagans believed that there was a God here and a God there, and they were all localized. And the concept here, of course, is maybe you happen to worship somebody who's got a little bit of influence, and you can get us off the hook here. Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Jonah's God is un as yet unnamed. Nobody knows who he is. And when he becomes known a little bit later in the book of Jonah, everybody reacts with shock because they've heard of him. Verse 7, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Proverbs 16, verse 33. Keep your place in Jonah chapter 1. Proverbs 16, verse 33. Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So God honored this lot casting ceremony uh, that actually served to identify who was the problem. I don't know whether you realize it, but this week actually a Jewish national holiday comes up. It's called Purim. And the uh, holiday of Purim mentioned in the book of Esther, uh, Purim actually means lots. There is a lot casting ceremony. I think there's two in the, bo in the book of Esther interesting read around this time of the year. So they cast lots to figure out who's causing the problem, just like Achan in the book of Joshua. Who is it? Verse 8, they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? Look at all those questions. They just pepper him with questions. They can't figure out who this guy is. Fast asleep in the belly of the ship. Who are you? What's going on here? Uh, what country are you from? This, I think, would, be, would have been typical of that ancient world. You know, they've got a bunch of people out on the sea. So they want to know where he comes from. And now his response. Verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the eternal. Now, when we read the Lord in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew YHVH, as we know. We don't know for sure how it was pronounced, but it's maybe something like Yahweh or Yahweh or something like that. Now, he's very specific here. You want to know which God I worship? I'll tell you which God I worship. I worship Yahweh, the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. We sang about it at the beginning of the song service. God's creative power. This God whom I worship is different from your gods. He made the sea and he made the dry land. And the fascinating thing here is the, is the reaction of the mariners when they hear about whom Jonah worships. But Jonah is slow to speak up. Jonah is slow to speak up. And uh, this reminds me of something I think that comes our way every now and then. And that is when we talk with friends and people that we are associates at work or college or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, it can be a little bit of a dilemma. When do we speak up? People sometimes ask us about our faith. Uh, what about your faith? What is this church that you go to? And I think at times that we members of the Church of God are perhaps just a little too shy. We are told that we're supposed to be ready to give an answer. We're supposed to tell people what our faith is. First Peter 3, verse 15. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. First Peter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We should have an answer, and people ask us from time to time. I, I'm always surprised when you're in this part of the country, I continue to be surprised how different this part of the country is, you know, the South, Dallas, how religious it is, how churchy it is, how frequently the subject of religion and church comes up. And you know, I think when people ask us, which church do you go to? Okay, they probably never heard of the Church of God or Worldwide Association, but you can tell in many cases they want to know a little bit more. And I think we should be ready with an answer. Decent people who want to know about our faith. Jonah was reluctant. He held back on his faith. And then we get to irony number two. Let's keep reading here. Uh, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? The men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. 
Jonah, a servant of the true God, was slow to speak up. He was slow to speak up. I think he's still trying to get away from everything. He made it known, and they were afraid. Look at verse 10. Isn't that interesting how many times we see in the Bible that other nations had heard of the God of Israel or heard of the God of the Hebrews? There's so many of these kind of echo effect uh, uh, instances in the Bible. In, back in the book of Numbers with Balaam, as uh, you know, the Israelites are moving through and appear, appears that the Moabites and all those other folks knew about it. So they reacted with horror. He didn't say, of course, I'm a worshiper of Baal. He said, I'm a worshiper of Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. And uh, they'd heard of him. Verse 11, uh, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. It's getting stronger and stronger. Isn't this amazing? God's hand is all the way through this book. God is involved in Jonah's life. I think there's a message there for us. Verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah finally becomes a little more sensitive to God's hand. And verse 13, nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. It's getting worse and worse. And they're trying desperately to show to save Jonah's life. They want to save him. They don't want to throw him overboard. We'd like to save you. Verse 14. Therefore they cried out to the Eternal and said, We pray, O Eternal, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. Irony number three. The mariners here recognize God's supreme power. They, are, they talk to God. They cry out to God here. Uh, the Lord. This is the covenant name of God. Jonah believed he could escape from God. He didn't understand that there was no way to escape. It's interesting, the, uh, the pagans believed that you could, you could get away. You remember probably uh, Balaam and Balak jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop, trying to get away from God. The pagans believed you could get away from God geographically. Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115 and verse 3. Psalm 115 and verse 3 says, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Jonah took a little bit of time to be reminded of that. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the eternal exceedingly. Compare with verse 5, where they're praying to their own gods Every man calling out to their own gods. They've learned a lesson here. They received a kind of a witness from Jonah. They feared the Lord exceedingly, capital L-O-R-D, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Again, a wonderful little twist of irony here. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God prepared. This was very deliberate. God knew what he wanted Jonah to do, and he wasn't about to let him get off the hook. This is the work you've got to do. You know, reading this and thinking about this a little bit more, I wonder how much of a message there is for us here. Sometimes, you know, we, we need a, a, a push. We have to take a real hard push to do some of the things that need to be done in life. Some people, some people change very quickly. Some people are very sensitive. They are sensitive to God's hand. They know what God wants of them. Other people sometimes have to be pushed and shoved and come up against life's circumstances. And then suddenly they say, oh, now I know what God requires of me. Anyway, God prepared this great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is very deliberate. And as you know, this became the sign of Jesus' messiahship in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. And you wonder about that. What did it feel like to be in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights? Of course, he had no food. He wasn't able to take care of his personal needs. Probably some of his skin is getting worn away by, by some of the acid in the stomach of this thing. Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
very important thing that happened here. And in chapter two, Jonah prays to God. Now, I didn't bring a, 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 with me a book that I've got on my shelf, but I recommend here, if you've got this book, some of you may have in your collection, if you've got R.K. Harrison's Old Testament introduction, I've got it on my shelf in the office back there. And Harrison, I think he's now deceased, but he was a very good scholar. And he's got a wonderful section in that book where he describes instances of mariners in the South Pacific and elsewhere being swallowed up by fish. Because, of course, some people, you know, sneer at this. How could this possibly be? And Harrison documents from some, uh, some old articles and so on of individuals who were swallowed up and you know, found an air pouch inside the, the belly of a fish and eventually came out of it alive. So take a look at that if you get a chance. But Jonah's prayer. Jonah prayed to the Lord God from the fish's belly. I think this is pretty uncomfortable. We're talking in class just yesterday about uncomfortable prayer. And I mentioned that sometimes when I've been in a hotel room and, uh, you know, the only place to pray is the bathroom, I prayed with my, you know, the elbows on the commode and everybody looked back and, you know, there are easier ways to pray in the bathroom. So anyway, I guess we all develop our own technique for praying when we're in a hotel room and all that's available is the bathroom. This was a whole lot worse than the commode. Uh, he prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said... I cried out to the Lord, and because of my affliction, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Verse 3, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Jonah is beginning to come round. And it took this to force him to do what God told him to do. The waters encompass me, verse 5, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. One commentator says, oh, it's not, not a real story because you don't have any weeds in the belly of a fish. Well, I don't know. I've never been into the belly of a fish to check it out. But, of course, the weeds were probably wrapping around his head as he went downward. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. You've kept me alive here. And Jonah, who was a bit uh, hard-headed, needed the tough experience to get through to him. Verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And what we've got here is a fascinating prayer of resignation. Prayer of resignation. We've mentioned in the sermonette we're approaching the Passover, we're approaching the days of unleavened bread. And I think when we look at ourselves in the spring, one of the most difficult things to, for Christians to deal with is their own will, our own will. But sometimes it's the same as God's will. Sometimes it can be different from God's will. And of course we know that our Savior uh, sent up to the Father a prayer of resignation. In Matthew 26, let's keep our place in Jonah and go to Matthew 26. That prayer of resignation, I think, is part of the life of every Christian at some moment. Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You ever think about, about what an amazing prayer this really was, you know? Uh, Christ, in his pre-existence, and the Father had talked about this for how long? <laughs> we don't know. For a long, long time. It was understood this was part of the plan of God. Verse 42. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. This remarkable prayer of resignation. Verse 44, he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Jonah said, he came to this point in the belly of the fish, I give up my will. I give up my will. Those who regard worthless idols, verse 8, forsake their own mercy. Irony number four. Irony number four. Jonah had to be swallowed up before he gave up his own will. Unlike the mariners. Unlike the Ninevites, who were going to rep repent in, at the end of chapter 3, he had to be swallowed up before he gave up his own will. Psalm 32 and verse 9. Psalm 32 and verse 9. 
We sing this one. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. The horse and the mule. You ever been like a horse or a mule in your spiritual life? I think at times I've resembled a horse or a mule and maybe not been as sensitive as I should have to God's hand. That ability to be sensitive to God's hand and to know what he expects of us. It may not save you or me from being swallowed up in the belly of a great fish, but it can save an awful lot of heartache. And I think this is a very important point. And part of the art, part of the uh, knowledge of what it is to be a true Christian, being sensitive to God's hand without having to be swallowed up. Verse 9, Jonah 2, verse 9, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Finally, he's come around. He talks about the God of mercy there in verse 8. And he says, okay, now I'm going to fulfill what I vowed, although he came to it the tough way. I think there's a lesson. We should come to it the easy way. We should come to it the easy way. And then here he says, salvation is of the Lord. And of course, salvation in this context is actually for the Ninevites. And uh, Jonah was not a terribly great fan of that. Verse 10, so the eternal spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You wonder what he looked like. I think it was really a bad hair day. <laughs> this was really, a, it was probably, I don't know what he looked like. I think probably some of his skin had been worn away from being in the inside of this fish. Yeah, it was a bad hair day. And uh, he comes up on dry land. Of course, some have said, well, they worship the fish god, Dagon, and that's the reason why they repented. I think there's a little more to their repentance than that. But he certainly didn't look good. Um, and uh, then he finally is in agreement to go and do what God told him to do. And the, where it's sa stated in verse 2, let's read that. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the, the message that I tell you. It's the same as in chapter 1, verse 2. Jonah gets a second bite. You ever had a second bite? You ever had to take a second shot at something that you got wrong the first time? One of the lessons here, I think, is that God can be very merciful. God gives us mercy. He allows us a second shot at it. He doesn't give up on us quickly. And Jonah learned it the hard way. Verse 3, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. It was a very, very big city, and he goes with clenched teeth. And one of the criticisms of this book is, well, Nineveh was not really that big. Apparently, ancient uh, uh, Nineveh, the uh, the uh, Total territory of Nineveh, uh, greater Nineveh, was actually very, very great. It was uh, a large extended territory. And then he walks in, and people listened to him. Verse 4, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Look at how few words there are in this encapsulation of his message calling for the Ninevites to repent. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And they repented. They repented. They didn't need to do it the hard way. They didn't need to do it the hard way. The first time, first time through, they repented. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. It was quite a gesture here. You know, for the king of a great empire to do a thing like that showed tremendous humility. And we don't know for sure which Ninevite or uh, Assyrian king it was, but the Bible tells us that this was what he did. This is repentance, real repentance. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Man, beast, herds, flocks... You know, the animals were considered part of the community in the ancient world. And he declares a fast for the entirety of Nineveh. Verse, uh, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Isn't that interesting? That use of the word violence there. Whoever this king was, he knew he knew what their problem was. This was their, probably their number one sin. They were terribly, terribly violent. 
And when jo Jonah came forward and said, you're going to repent, they knew what they had to repent of, at least the king did, and it's quite a remarkable thing here. And of course, when we put out the gospel, when we put out the gospel in the form of our publications and online and so on, the hope is that people, and our prayer should be, that people will receive that message and repent. We don't just put it out there, like Jonah in the next chapter, looking forward to them getting zapped. You know, Jonah was not very pleased about their, uh, about their repentance. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he has said he would bring on them and he did not do it. Now, this is amazing what happens here. Have you ever stopped to think about this? How many occasions do we find in the Bible where a people repent? Ever thought about this? It's pretty unusual. I can't think of anyone else where there's a kind of a mass repentance. There are individual repentances and so on. There are others who come in contact with God and his message. But they repented. And the irony num number five here is that the Ninevites repented quickly. They received a message and they repented. Jonah needed repeated proddings. He needed to go through it by experience. And I think, you know, that says a lot. You know, some, some human beings are pretty tough. They don't just pick it up and run with it because they've heard it. They have to run into the consequences of their actions. Maybe that refers, applies to some in the Dallas congregation, uh, the way that you came into the church and other people just hear the message and listen to it and say, oh, this rings true, I gotta do something. It was to their eternal credit that they repented. Matthew 12, verse 41. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. Because uh, Jesus Christ makes reference of their destiny in the judgment at the end of that 1,000 years. Matthew 12, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. This was their, to their eternal credit. God takes no pleasure in punishment. God doesn't enjoy castigating people, destroying people, putting them to death, punishing them. Our God is a God of life. Our God, our God is a God of life. And I think it's worthwhile for us to concentrate on that and think about that, especially as we come down to the Passover spring season. Our God is a giver of life. And the longer you go through life, the more you realize what a precious gift life is. It's a wonderful thing. It's a marvelous thing. And God is not eager to take away life from anyone. What he wants is for people to get their way of life in line with what he commands. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. We'll come back to Jonah in just a minute. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33 and verse 11. Say to them, Ezekiel says, As I live, says the Lord Eternal, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God is not, you know, of course, this is the concept in some religious traditions, that God is just eager to see as many people as possible burning in agony. No, that's not the God whom we worship. I have no pleasure in the de death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? And of course, the first word in the title of our internet site is life. Life and hope and truth. And as we come to the Passover, Jesus says, he is the way, he is the life. That theme of life is such a big theme in the Bible. It's a wonderful, wonderful theme. Life is, is it's, it's great, it's a, it's a good thing. And God is the author of life. He desires to give life. Verse 10 again, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Remarkable events that take place here. Now, everyone's happy. You're happy. I'm happy. God's happy. Ninevites are happy. Marin is probably happy because they didn't get swallowed up in the great deep. Everyone is happy. And now we come to the next irony because the only one who's not happy is Jonah. Jo Jonah 4 verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. Why? Why? Why would Jonah not have been pleased? You know, Billy Graham died this week. You've probably seen this on, on the news. This was better than Billy Graham. You ever see a Billy Graham uh, sermon 
Well, I watch, he was quite a preacher, by the way. And, you know, he had all these people come down to the front of the stage, come down, uh, stand up for the Lord, or whatever he, he would say. And people came down to the front, and who knows how long uh, it took, how much of a change it made in people's lives. We're, of course, not the judge of that. But Jonah's preaching here was more effective than Billy Graham's, and you'd think he would say, yippee, this is wonderful, this is good. Why? Well, probably because he hated the Ninevites. It's probably, it was a very important factor here. He didn't like them because they were not his own people. Uh, and uh, the irony here, number, irony number six, God, Jonah wanted forgiveness for himself. He didn't want it for the Ninevites. Verse two, Jonah four, verse two. So he prayed to the eternal and he said, ah, eternal, was it not this what I said when I was still in my country? God, I told you so. These people have a nasty habit of repenting. Therefore, I fled previously, previously to Tarshish. You understand now, God, why I did that? You know, you rebuked me for this, and I went through all of this misery. I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And Jonah is actually quoting from one of my favorite passages in the bar Bible. Back in Exodus 34, this was Moses in the cleft of the rock. Exodus 34 Verses 6 and 7, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. The Eternal passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Eternal, the Eternal God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now there in verse six, the first adjective that's used for God in Exodus 34 verse six is merciful. And Jonah knew that, but he wasn't as merciful as the God whom he's serving. He didn't like it. He wasn't happy about it at all. And then verse three, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live He's really down. He's contemplating suicide or at least talking about it. There are others in the Bible who talked about the fact that they didn't like life anymore. They wanted to give up on it. We can think of an, quite a number of individuals. Elijah in the cave. Jeremiah got suicidal. The prophet Habakkuk got suicidal. Jonah. But what we've got here is a kind of a spasm of selfishness. He should have been rejoicing. Verse 4. Then the Eternal said, is it right for you to be angry? The answer to that question was no. So Jonah went out of the city and he sat on the east side of the city and there he made himself a shelter and he sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And he makes a little consolation prize, a booth, a shelter, a tabernacle. And he's, you know, you wonder whether he's still sitting there on the east side of the city, still with that forlorn hope that God will zap those Ninevites because he's not pleased with what's happened. Jonah was vindictive. Verses 6, 7, and 8 of this chapter in each case have the phrase, God prepared. God is very much involved here in teaching Jonah a lesson and I think in teaching us a lesson as well. Verse 6, the eternal God prepared a plant, another consolation prize after the booth. It's a kikayon. You probably got that in your margin. A castor oil plant or maybe a gourd. It's sometimes referred to as a gourd. God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He's got a little bit of temporary relief. And then verse 7, it goes bad again. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. This is the second time God prepares something and you can imagine that little worm finding the roots of that plant and chewing on them and Jonah's little bit of consolation is gone. Verse eight, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared, there's the third time, a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself, and he said, it is better for me to die than to live. This is the second time he's talking about wanting to end his life. Suicidal, should have been rejoicing, and God is teaching him a lesson through all of this. Of course, when people repent, that's a good thing. That's part of the lesson for us. We should rejoice. But irony number seven is here, Jonah is more concerned with his own comfort than with the salvation of others. He's more concerned with his own comfort than with the salvation of others. And again, I wonder if there's a lesson there for us as well. 
Um, let's keep our place here for just a moment and go forward to Acts 14, verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. You think about this scripture where the apostle Paul is strengthening the disciples and he makes a very important statement here. Acts 14, verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. It's not an easy road to the kingdom of God. And I think for some of us, probably by comparison with those who've gone before us, it has been relatively easy. Jonah learned the hard way. He placed his own comfort before the salvation of others. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant God demands of Jonah? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. I think he had his arms crossed in front of his chest. Moody, angry, uh, in a tiff. Verse 10. But the Eternal said, you've had pity on the plant for which you've not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. It's not that big a deal, Jonah. It's not that big. And sometimes for us at times, things that are small get to be bigger than they should be, and the things that are big are not big enough in our minds. Something big has happened here, Jonah. A people has repented. Verse 11, the last verse in the book. And should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons, greater Nineveh, no doubt, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left. They hadn't received the law the way Jonah had. And also much livestock. This wonderful rhetorical question here. Where do you get off, Jonah, being angry about this? You had pity on the plant. You're telling me I can't have pity on these people who knew nothing until you walked into their city and you called on them to repent, and then something very, very good happened. Wonderful little rhetorical question with which the book of Jonah ends. A few questions for us as we wrap this up here today. Some questions for us. Number one, question number one. Are we quick to worship God or are we sleepy? Are we quick to worship God or are we sleepy? Jonah was asleep in the belly of the ship, and they had to wake him up. And he took some proddings before he finally prayed before God. Psalm 132, Psalm 132, verses 3 through 5. Psalm 132, verses 3 through 5. David probably uh, refers, uh, uh, the author of this psalm. Psalm 132, verse 3. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. David was different. He was quick to pray. And I think we've all been in that sleepy time situation and, you know, just want to hit the sack and go, to, go off to sleep. And uh, sometimes we should just push ourselves a little bit. Talk to God just before we go to bed, even if the bulk of our prayer is the following morning, but talk to God, thank him for the day, thank him for the things that he's given us, and thank him for the life he's given us. Are we quick to worship or are we sleepy? Question number two, are we willing to forgive and let go? Are we willing to forgive and let go? And I believe that this is one of the big challenges in the life of the Christian being willing to forgive and let go. Some people can't let go. I think it probably has to do with temperament a little bit. Some people find it harder than others, and yet that is what God requires of us, to forgive and let go. Jonah couldn't let it go. He had real difficulty. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Jesus here tells us, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Quite a strong statement, isn't it? And yet I think all of us from time to time have struggled with this when something has happened that we perceived as unfair or maybe indeed was unfair or, you know, it's sometimes difficult to sort it out. But God says, let it go. And Jonah had difficulty doing that. And question number three, and we've already broached this, are we more interested in our own comfort or in the salvation of others? 
Are we more interested in our own comfort or in the salvation of others? And I think we all think about this from time to time, the fact that we're going through some good times at present. We have everything provided for us. Our lives are really pretty good. And we know that time is going to come when it's not going to be like that anymore. I don't know how far in the future. Sometimes I, I think to myself, well, it could be. We don't know how far in the future. When that changes, the work of preaching the gospel will be over. And it's my opinion that God still wants the gospel to go out. And it's partly as a result of that that we live the way we do and we're able to enjoy life the way we are. But anyway, Jonah put his own comfort ahead of the salvation of others. Hopefully we don't. Lots of le lessons there, seven ironies, lots of lessons and lessons for us from the book of Jonah.